All right. Well, hi, hello, and welcome to Getting Ready for PCI DSS 4.0 and its impacts to network security. Now, today's exciting webinar is sponsored by Firemon and GuidePoint Security and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Jess Steinbach with Actual Tech Media, and I am so excited to be your moderator for this conversation because I'm honestly looking forward to learning a little bit more about the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, or PCI DSS. And this is such a foundational element of security and confidentiality when we're talking about cardholder data. This area affects all of us, really. Uh, and as the threat landscape evolves, so do our security needs. And not just that, because we're also looking at compliance updates and standard updates. And this is the absolute perfect time to be looking at this topic because, as you know, we have some new standards coming into effect in March of 2024. So now is the time to be digging in, to be thinking, to expanding your understanding and getting ready, getting ready for those new updates in 2024. I can't believe how fast that's coming up. Luckily, we have some incredible experts here with us today to help us navigate the nuances and developments that you need to have in mind as as we approach this new release, those new standards coming in. So get ready, get excited, and let's dive in. Now I'm going to get our expert speakers on out here with me in just a moment, but I want to get through a few quick housekeeping points and then we'll get the show on the road. So. We're going to take our guided tour of your audience console. We're going to start out with the questions window. This is the absolute best place to get involved, get interactive, post those questions, those comments, any feedback or ideas that you have, get them in that questions window today. Now we're going to give it a little bit of a test run. So I see a few of you doing this already. We got Joseph and Richard and Reg and Murray all out there. John, I see you all. You start posting those highs and hellos. This is your test run. This is your dress rehearsal for the day today. So say hi, say hello. Let us know how your day is going. We want to hear from all of you. Now that questions window is also going to be the place to reach out and let us know if you do have any technical issues during our session today. Knock on wood, of course, but if they do come up, slides not advancing, audio, anything like that, a browser refresh is going to clear out any of those usual issues. But if the tech gremlins have a real hold on you today, no problem. Just shoot a message in that questions tab and the actual tech media team will be there to help you out. All right, now the last thing that I wanna point out on our audience console here is that handouts window. If you have not already explored the handouts, please make sure that you're doing that throughout our session today. We're gonna to chat a little bit about some of these uh, options and resources a little bit later, but I do wanna make sure that you've got those saved, open the, those tabs and save those for later because you will want those follow-ups once we wrap our conversation. All right, and as always, it is not just awesome content that we are giving away in our session today. We also have a $250 Amazon gift card as a prize drawing at the end of our webinar. Now, of course, you do need to be here in live attendance at the webinar in order to win, and all winners must meet the actual Tech Media Prize terms and conditions. If you don't have those memorized, don't worry about it. Neither do I. The full T's and C's are listed for you in the handouts tab, so you can head on over there, click in, scroll down, and you'll find them waiting for you there. One last way to win a prize today, and just to be extra awesome, is the $50 Best Question gift card. So this is our little gold star to all you curious and inquisitive folks out there. So when you ask that question, not only are you bringing up the cool, fun conversation that we're having today, but you are also entered to win that $50 Amazon gift card. Again, we review all the questions asked after we wrap. So even if we don't get to you in our live session today, we will get a follow-up uh, either way in, in answer and also you could potentially win that $50 Amazon gift card. So stay tuned for that and keep those questions coming in. Speaking of questions, I think it's about time that we get our expert presenters on out here with us and start this conversation. So today we will be chatting with a dynamic duo. Our expert presenters are Lisa Wallace, Senior Sales Engineer at Firemon, and Dan Mengel, Pr uh, Practice Director, Compliance at GuidePoint Security. This is obviously a powerhouse team. I can't wait to dig into this conversation. I'm so excited to learn more. So I'm going to step back and hand things over. Dan, I think you're going to kick us off. So take it away. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Jess. And make sure you can hear me okay. Yeah, we got you loud and clear. Fantastic. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Um, as uh, Jess said, I'm the uh, practice director for the compliance team here at GuidePoint Security. Uh, my team focuses primarily on assessment and advisory services that are tied to cybersecurity standards like the uh, PCI DSS. So um, 
glad to be here and uh, looking forward to being able to share kind of what this looks like um, from a network security standpoint uh, and also a little a little more holistically with regard to kind of what we're looking at with this new version of the standard that is forthcoming. So with that being said, uh, this is a timeline with which many of you are undoubtedly familiar. Uh, the uh, current version of the PCI DSS that is still in effect until the end of March is version 3.2.1. Uh, version 4.0 was released now uh, almost two years ago, and we're now getting close to that March 31st, 2024 date when the uh, version 3.2.1 will be sunsetted and will no longer be an option for entities to uh, assess and, and certify. So, so that time is coming very quickly. Uh, hard to believe we're already at the end of 2023, but uh, this is where we are. Uh, so glad you're here with us exploring this now. Um, some of you might be in kind of a little bit of a panic mode. That's okay. Um, better late than never. Uh, there's some things that we can unpack here that I think will help you from a uh, from a general approach perspective, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna unpack that. Uh, please know that there are some future data requirements included in version four. So some requirements uh, in version four will be in effect immediately uh, as of this coming March. There are additional requirements marked as future data that will not be immediately required. Uh, the council calls them best practices until March 31st, 2025. However, you are going to want to take a look at those holistically as part of your approach to PCI and being ready for version four because some of those future data requirements do have some more involved implications uh, that might take some additional resourcing and planning in order to, to really uh, get in place uh, and be effective. So with that being said, we're gonna dive a little bit into really what are we, what are we seeing that is different here? Um, since we are focusing on network security, we, we, will, we will be highlighting certain aspects that uh, have to do more specifically with, with network security. But again, a lot of this is going to be broadly applicable regardless of, of your particular focus uh, or level in your organization with regard to this particular standard. So um, one of the major uh, change that the council has made that I think has really helped matters with version four is they have taken a lot of their content and moved it uh, from other places such as the FAQs posted on their website, information supplements, and other documentation, they've moved that um, directly into the standard itself. Now, it makes for a much longer document to read, unfortunately, but it also gives much of that content the force of the standard, if you will. And there's a lot of additional uh, clarification and content that they have, have added that I think is hugely helpful. Some of it um, really hasn't changed that much. Uh, for example, uh, scoping and segmentation, you know, th those rules are still pretty much the same. Um, there can be some slight variance and sometimes you're getting into variants that might be more tied to variants with regard to the, the payment brands, but that, that direction is, is by and large is, is still the same. But there's a great deal of, of definition that has been, been added, uh, digging into, um, you know, okay, what exactly do we mean when we say quarterly, annually, significant change, and so forth? Uh, these are terms that uh, if you've been through a, a, any kind of, of PCI DSS assessment, you, you already know where, where some of those gray areas have been in the past. And uh, the council, I think, has taken some steps here to really uh, help to clarify their intent on some of these. Now, it's a, it's a standard, and there's always going to be some gray areas. Um, but I think there's, a, uh, there's a definitely a, a step forward here from a clarification perspective. I think the most important thing that the council has added uh, that is helpful is the glossary. The glossary being directly in the standard straight up definition of terms, some of them with some pretty lengthy explanations uh, is really going to form the foundation for the standard itself. Okay, well, what do we mean by, by these particular terms? And you're going to see a couple of those expanded upon as we, as we talk through this. So another major change that the council has made, and again, this is applicable across the entire, uh, the entire standard, is this concept that you may have heard of with regard to a defined approach versus a customized approach. So if you're familiar with the DSS, um, 
with version 3.2.1 and prior versions, you know that, okay, we've got a pretty specific, sometimes uh, painfully prescriptive, can be, uh, requirement that, uh, that we need to abide by. Um, that's described and there's a specific testing procedure uh, listed that the assessor has to do uh, in order to confirm that that control is in place. So we're familiar with that um, with uh, existing and prior versions of the DSS. That's basically the defined approach. So that that is exactly what we're used to. Um, if you know you have been through uh, this exercise before, you've had a, uh, a Insco PCI environment for some time. Uh, you can continue to do this, and that kind of approach is the, is the same. Um, however, if you are a, let's say you are a larger organization, let's say you are a, and I will say it this way, uh, a more um, mature organization with regard to your risk management, or maybe you're doing some things that are uh, really cutting edge, bleeding edge, innovative from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, if you're the kind of org that looks at the some of these requirements and go, we are so far past this. We are doing things that are addressing the risk this requirement is intended to address, and we're doing it so much more differently, so much more completely than what this is stating. That's typically where you're going to see this customized approach be um, potentially to your advantage. Now, there is a lot more work. There's a lot more paperwork that goes into that, but the type of organization for which this is well suited um, you know, is most likely going to have a lot of this already determined, developed, and in place. So it does give an option for those, those kinds of situations. Uh, so far in our experience, uh, we've not seen that uh, leverage significantly uh, for the orgs that we are, are working with. Uh, we're expecting to see this more leverage with some of your larger global organizations, um, you know, large uh, service providers, managed service uh, providers, and so forth. So, um, so definitely uh, an intriguing option uh, and one that certainly can help uh, in certain situations, depending on what your cybersecurity and your risk program looks like. So with that in mind, the layout of the uh, requirements in the DSS, there are several different components that we want to highlight. So we're used to the very specific requirement. You're seeing that here as the defined approach requirement. It's the same kind of, uh, kind of idea. Uh, we've got the testing procedure. That's what we're used to. We've got uh, the guidance column. We're kind of used to that as well. You're going to find that the guidance columns, uh, the content has been significantly expanded on for most requirements. In fact, for future data requirements, in many cases, you're going to see that content run to a page and a half. So lots and lots of detail and background there to help you. Um, notice we also have a customized approach objective. So that's really the restating of the requirement from a risk perspective. So we're using an example here because we're focusing on network security today, we're using a requirement from requirement one, which primarily focuses in that arena. So you're, you're seeing that the objective under the customized approach, it's saying the same thing, but in a way where it frees up an organization using the customized approach to basically articulate and determine, okay, these are the controls that we are going to uh, implement and attest to in order to fulfill this particular risk objective. So it gets you to the same place. One important thing to note as you're looking at the DSS is that for all intents and purposes, the first two columns are the standard. They are the force of the standard they must be complied with. And that does include the applicability notes. So the applicability notes is some further clarification of the requirement. Uh, and that uh, that content is in play and is going to be going to be key for you. Um, the guidance column is exactly that. It you do not have to explicitly comply with 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 or approach the requirement uh, in manners that are suggested by the guidance. So that's a very important distinction uh, that comes into play more with some requirements than others, uh, where there'll be some examples. That's not to say that you have to. Um, go that specific route in order to fulfill the requirement, but it does it does help to to clarify. So lots and lots to unpack here. 
And what you're going to see throughout the standard, uh, you're going to see some things that change across the entire um, uh, across the entire standard. So, for example, um, you know, version three to one and prior, we, uh, if you're familiar with the last requirement in almost every section that talks about policies and procedures being documented in use and known to all affected parties. So that's been expanded. Uh, something the council has implied for um, for a long time is that uh, that those are kept up to date. So the term up to date is now officially in here. What you're also going to see across the entire DSS is um, a more formalization of uh, roles and responsibilities. So in the current version of the standard, there are uh, several specific uh, roles that are called out in requirement 12 that uh, there is made explicitly clear with regard to having those roles and responsibilities documented and understood. That concept has now been expanded to the entire DSS. So you're going to see this roles and responsibilities requirement in every section, including requirement one. So anyone who has any kind of a role in fulfilling uh, any requirement in uh, with regard to the DSS, those roles and responsibilities have to be documented, assigned, and understood. So again, network security context, let's say that you are the control owner or the, the control owner manager for um, uh, for a, a group of firewalls that are that are in scope. Okay, well, again, anything that you're doing with regard to uh, maintaining those systems, keeping them up to date, doing rule set reviews, whatever that whatever that may be, those responsibilities do have to be clearly documented, assigned, and understood. So there's going to be um, very specific documentation that an assessor would be be looking for in that scenario. You're also going to see throughout the DSS that there are additional reviews that are now mandated that the assessed entity must perform. You'll see an example uh, on the next slide uh, with regard to requirement one in the network security space. You'll see that through here as well. The council is also leveraging, heavily leveraging that glossary um, and uh, using those terms to be very specific with regard to what applies where. So you're going to see the example here is there is a difference and you need to know the difference between account data versus cardholder data versus primary account number versus sensitive account data. Because the depending on which term or terms are used in the requirement could change the applicability and the scope of that requirement and what you need to do there. So definitely look very closely on that front. Um, one of the terms that you're going to see also throughout the, the standard is the term periodically. Some requirements have specific time frames. You have to do this uh, you know, quarterly or annually. Um, some requirements uh, have the term periodically. Well, what does that mean at this point? What that means is you get to determine um, as an entity what makes sense for you. So let's say that. Um, and I usually, and this is going a little outside of network security, but the, the, the easiest example here is if you have uh, payment terminals that require periodic, periodic inspection for tampering or substitution. Um, you can decide, because and that um, requirement in both 321 and 4.0 uses the word periodically. Okay, so that means that we could inspect those terminals once every six months. We could inspect those terminals once every hour. We could use a completely different schedule for different groups of terminals. You get to determine that. The addition and the clarification of version four is that you have to basically write down your justification. How did you come up with that? What kind of risk analysis did you do in order to determine that it's appropriate for us to inspect those terminals once every six months or once a week or once an hour or whatever that, that might be? In fact, the council literally yesterday just published uh, example templates that you can use for this. You don't have to use those, but they are available on the website along with, with other, uh, other documents, including the full DSS itself is available uh, on the website. So last thing to keep in mind as far as overall changes, I mentioned earlier about future data requirements. 
Um, that is going to be a March 31st, 2025 due date. So what does that mean in, in practical terms? Again, the time is now to start planning and resourcing for those. They do need to be in place as of that point. But as you know, the recurring assessment is an annual event. So depending on the timing of that, will determine when they actually get assessed. But from a planning perspective, you do need to, especially now that we are 15 months out from, from those being required, uh, we need to look at those now and start figuring out exactly how we're going to, to implement that. So what I want to do from a practical standpoint here is I want to take you through <clears throat> kind of a, a summary of changes, and we're just going to focus on requirement one for time's sake today, uh, and also given our focus on network security. So uh, if you're interested in, in a breakdown that gets into the other requirements, that's uh, something that we can certainly help you with if you like. So uh, we've got some changes that have been made in requirement one. Uh, the 12 sections still are largely the same purpose and intent as they are under version 3.2.1. So requirement one is still primarily that network layer security mindset. That is our focus for today. Um, as I mentioned, um, the policies and procedures and roles and responsibilities requirements you're going to see as the first two requirements of every section, requirement one is no exception to that. Something that's going to be of key interest for those of you on this uh, webinar that are interested in network security. Another update that has been long overdue and is a welcome change in version four is some updating of the terminology from a technology perspective. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about a standard that originated back in the client server era to which I, I go back to. And uh, in this day and age, there are you know, lots of different ways that uh, these different technology controls are being implemented. For example, just simple, the term firewall. Well, OK, you, we could still use that term. Um, <clears throat> firewall can stretch back to um, that could be a physical uh, physical box sitting in your data center. Could be a physical box sitting in someone else's data center. It could be a virtual appliance. It could be um, a container. It could be. Uh, and uh, an AWS security group, it can take a lot of different forms. So the term you're going to see throughout requirement one that is replaced firewall is network security control. Whatever is actually controlling primarily, but not exclusively at layer three, controlling the flow of traffic, you know, into, out of, and through the in-scope environment. So keep that in mind as you're, as you're reading through this. So, um, couple of minor changes that have, have been made, uh, same idea from a, uh, from a uh, terminology perspective, the idea of a DMZ. Again, it's, it think the real world is more complex than that, to be very honest. So the idea of a DMZ, while it's still there, it's really evolved into what's more realistic for today, the idea of, okay, what do we consider a trusted network, something that we manage, um, something that is that is untrusted. So you're going to see that throughout as well. Um, changes um, and really any any change that you make to a an NSC. So that's going to be a configuration rule set, whatever. Um, there's a more explicit requirement that that follows a change management process. Something you're probably already doing uh, from a uh, just from a, from a best practice from a risk perspective. Uh, it's just a little little more formalized. Um, one, so I think the two most significant changes from a network security perspective, as reflected in requirement one, are really going to be 1.2.7 and 1.3.3, which you're seeing here. Uh, and you're seeing the 127, that's, that's a, a straight up quote. So we are now looking for reviews of not just the, the rules, like what traffic are you allowing, disallowing. We are looking for a more holistic configuration <clears throat> review of that NSC because there's obviously a lot more that these systems are uh, potentially doing uh, from a network security perspective. That review now has to happen at least once every six months. And the council has clarified in FAQs and now in the DSS itself, when they give you a specific time frame, like once every six months, 
they really mean that. It has to occur. No, the, the first review and the second review cannot be more than 180 days apart. So very specific on that front and that content is in there. The other major change that we are seeing in requirement one has to do with uh, if there's any component of the CDE, the cardholder data environment, uh, that is uh, leveraging a wireless network. So uh, under 321, this was not a requirement, but in version four it is that if you have a part of your CDE that is wired and part of your CDE that is wireless, uh, even if they live right next to each other, there still has to be an NSC, some type of network uh, security control um, and managing traffic between the two, even if they are both CDE. So this could potentially represent a, a, um, uh, an architectural change. Uh, this could represent uh, a slight additional overhead from a security management perspective, traffic flow analysis, et cetera. Definitely something that you want to look into. The good news on requirement one is um, that you don't have any future data requirements. So uh, compared to most of the other sections, this list of changes is a little shorter and we don't have any future data. The bad news is, of course, means that all of this is going to be in play uh, as of uh, the end of March. So I'm going to uh, quickly move through the next couple here to make sure there's we've got enough time uh, for Lisa to, to share her insights here. Um, but uh, one of the changes with version four is the council completely redid the reporting compliance or ROC template. So if you are an organization that has to uh, have a ROC completed, just know that there is a lot more work that goes into it from an assessor standpoint. And if you're leveraging the customized approach for any requirement, there is significantly more work involved um, on the assessed entity side as well. So a lot more info that is required. Uh, an additional document uh, called an items noted for improvement or infi uh, document also, that's a separate doc that has to be completed by the assessor. Uh, notating items that were, when initially assessed during the assessment, were found to not be in place, uh, but were corrected by the entity during the assessment, which is a pretty common occurrence. Um, that is a required document that the assessor now has to complete um, and provide to the entity. So definitely something you want to be familiar with, kind of what the, the rules of the road are around that particular document. If you're an organization that uh, uh, reports compliance using a self-assessment questionnaire or SAQ, just know that the customized approach is not in play for you. So that means that uh, we are sticking to uh, the defined approach to the requirements that we are used to. There used to be some um, variation, slight variation in the wording between the actual DSS and the um, uh, wording in the SAQ with regard to the requirements that has been addressed um, and a couple other minor changes that go along with the uh, uh, with the SAQ. So by and large, the same process, same kind of thing, uh, just a little more a little more synchronization uh, on that front. So um, if you came into this webinar sweating, uh, if you're still sweating a little bit, uh, you know where where do I start? Uh, I need to get rolling on this. Um, here's a couple ideas for you. <sighs> Unfortunately. Like I said, no real way around reading the whole DSS. It's like 360 pages now with the different appendices, but you'll see which pieces are applicable to you pretty quickly. Also take a look at your reporting template. All of this is available on the council's public website. Uh, you wanna take a look at that from top to bottom, see what you're dealing with. Um, the, the scope validation process, uh, this is a new requirement that is in requirement 12. Uh, the assessed entity also has to do its own scoping exercise, its own scope analysis and documentation to say, this is what our, uh, what our scope is. Uh, that's in addition to any scope validation review that the assessor does. Uh, having a correct scope is absolutely critical. It is a key foundation for success uh, in dealing with this particular standard to try to ensure that things that you don't need to have in scope uh, are correctly removed from it uh, via required technical controls uh, from a, whether ever that might be, whether that be network segmentation, whether that is changing the business processes or, or whatever. Uh, so that is absolutely essential to get that rolling right now 
Uh, you can do that internally or with the help from a QSA like GuidePoint. Um, there's a whole lot of dates that go along with uh, implementing and maintaining PCI compliance, recurring activities that have to occur. Having that established uh, is very key. Um, look for requirements that are applicable to you and have that word periodically in it. Uh, those are the ones for which you're going to need to get rolling on that targeted risk analysis process. Uh, if you've already determined a frequency and you have that in place, it may simply be just a matter of document, kind of quickly reviewing that justification and getting it documented. There are also several additional inventories of different components, uh, not just hardware and software, but things like uh, payment scripts uh, for e-commerce channels, um, uh, uh, cryptography protocols in use, et cetera. Definitely look for that word inventory throughout the DSS in order to um, uh, see what is going to be in play for you there uh, and get rolling on that because those are also uh, not insignificant activities and in many cases may require technology uh, assistance in order to successfully um, fulfill. So I'll leave you with this before I turn it over to, to Lisa. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the team that I lead at the GuidePoint uh, is the compliance team, the C part of our GRC practice, which is the um, one of the teams that makes up our information assurance consulting arm that is available to assist with whatever you need um, from both the direct compliance perspective and also any supporting activities that uh, uh, with which you might need assistance in order to achieve and maintain compliance. So appreciate your time there. Um, we'll uh, I think we're uh, saving questions for at the end. Uh, but uh, with that, let me turn the presentation uh, over to Lisa to dive a little deeper uh, into some of the ways in which uh, some of these requirements could be addressed. Lisa? Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever we are in the world. Thank you, Dan. Um, and Ike, come on. Is the slide not moving, Lisa? The slide is not moving for me. I'm having a technical challenge. <laughs> well, let me, let me, let me, yeah, there we go. I just bumped it ahead for you. Teamwork. Perfect. I appreciate that. Y'all are awesome. My name is Lisa Wallace. I am a senior sales engineer for Firemon. What does that mean? I talk to our largest clients, to our smallest clients. One of the things that I focus on is compliance because I've, I've done it. I, I've been the person going through the audit. I've been the person helping you get ready for your audit. And Dan has done a spectacular job of telling us what we need to do. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how you might possibly do that. And I'm telling you, the slides just are not going to work for me today. Well, we can move them forward for you, Lisa. We'll tag that team. That would be fabulous. If we, <laughs> if we can move forward with one, that would be great. I got you. Just give um, us a cue and Dan or I will we'll move it on forward. <laughs> I appreciate you guys so much. Like I said, I talk to a lot of clients. I love talking to our clients. One of the things that I talk the most to people about is reach one to 4.0. What you can do is important. What you can show an auditor is the most important. You need to be able to have defensibility of your evidence. You need to be able to prove you're doing the things. If you're doing that by hand, I talked to a client within the last few months, they said, you know, we're doing PCI and we're doing PCI, we're doing our rule recertification, we're doing it manually, we're doing it with Excel, and it's a six month window and we go through, we do our QSA, we get everything done, and, and we start again two weeks later. It's five and a half months to get through that six month process. It takes a lot of time. Um, it takes a lot of manual work. And no one wants to spend that much time in Excel, including me. How do you make sure that you are consistently collecting that audit evidence? If an auditor comes in today and I've got a series of evidence that is put together with, you know, some typed up forms and a couple of Excel spreadsheets and a couple of interviews with my team and they come back in six months and that, that evidence is slightly different. How are they able to look and ensure that my company is still compliant? Can we bump onto the next one, please? Thank you. And then what happens if you get it wrong? N nobody sets out to get it wrong, but you know, it's gonna happen. Worst case scenario, you can lose your PCI certification altogether. You can no longer do card processing. Most more normally, we will see things like fines and penalties. 
increased transaction cost. You're, if you fail that PCI, if you fail that audit, your payment card process is going to look and say, hey, maybe you're not a tier one now. Maybe you're down the next tier and, and you're going to pay more for your transactions. That's going to be a cost to your business. You're going to, you've got some reputational loss. You know, XYZ company was fined. They had a PCI violation. There can be legal consequences. If you've actually divulged some customer data, you can have some legal consequences there. So there are a lot of risks to the business for not doing it correctly. And, and what I found when I was doing risk work is that no one was really doing it incorrectly on purpose. People fell into one of three buckets. They were doing it well and they were documenting it well. They were doing it well, but that manual process of the documentation was kind of falling off or that they were actually missing some things. And then that's where Dan and his team can help you make sure you're not missing anything. We're going to help you with the documentation. Can we bump forward one more, please? Okay, I'm just going to throw out an example here. I'm, as Dan said, we're, we're focusing in the, in the one dot requirement. This one references network change. All changes to network connections have to be approved and managed according to your change control process. Every enterprise class business, most of the medium sized class businesses and preponderance of the small businesses, they have a change control process. But again, what can you defend to the auditor? What can you show? Are you doing it with a spreadsheet? Are you taking workflow requests? Are you taking, hey, I need a change to this firewall via Slack? Um, who owns the applications that are in scope to make sure that if you are making changes to something that influences the sphere of PCI, who's that business owner? Who's doing that review? How, how are you ensuring you have the right person? And then how are you taking this preponderance of Slack messages and emails and somebody pinged me on Teams today and my spreadsheet's over here and I've got a few things in service now, but not everything. How, how am I gonna reconcile all of that? One more, please. Network Security Policy Management, NSPM, is the space that FireMon is in. Where I see this help clients is a few things. First off, it doesn't matter where your rules hang out. Dan referenced cloud earlier. We've got things that are hanging out in the cloud. Three years ago, four years ago, I did a talk for Palo Alto. And one of the things that came out of that is all of the healthcare people in the room says we will never touch the cloud. Now I'm seeing healthcare people making that move into the cloud. So as the technology shifts and the client shift, we've got these disparate platforms. All your rules are going to be in one place. I can go to the you know, 156 devices in my client estate. I've got clients with up to 3,000. The team laughs at me. I hate the phrase single pane of glass. I prefer single lens. I can take my cloud assets, uh, my on-prem assets, my virtual firewalls like a Fortinet in the cloud, and I can look at those all in one place. I've got rule documentation. One of the things that happened to me, um, I, fell under P I fell under PCI and a couple other things, we had older checkpoints. We used the rule documentation fields, but what we had behind that was a ticketing system that failed. We, we didn't really have full documentation on the rule itself. One of the things Firemon's going to give you is the ability to maintain that rule documentation within our database. It's not going to fall off if you change out the firewall. It's not going to fall off if you change out your ticketing system. We've got the ability to set up critical change alerts. If something in your PCI network changes, after hours, off hours, you haven't had that all hands on deck change window, but something changed, we're going to let you know immediately. You can report. I will tell you from an audit perspective, I've also been in the consulting space. Um, Dan may or may not be able to attest to this as well. From an auditing perspective, I got far fewer questions from an auditor on a reliable, automated, documented process that I could repeat on a regular basis. Here's my report. It's the same report that I gave you six months ago. Here are my changes. Here's the changes I've made. Here's where I've tightened up my controls versus handing them anything I did by hand. Word doc, spreadsheet, compilation of those Slack messages. We've got the ability to do access path analysis. We talked earlier about how you, now you need to know what is traversing your network, even between the wired and the wireless. What's going between there? We've got the ability to do traffic flow analysis. Take a look at that. Is what's going through there what you expect to be going through there, or do you have something unattended? You've got the ability to do workflow reviews. You can automate that process. Back to my client that says it takes them five and a half months to get through it with their spreadsheets. You can actually prompt that, hook it up to an ITSM solution, and go through. We can also, when you're automating the rule review, 
we can flag those controls. If you've got PCI as a standard assigned to a device and you're getting ready to put an exchange and, and that exchange is going to violate that, we're going to come up and tell you, hey, this is going to violate a control here. You, you potentially got a compliance violation. There may be a reason that the business needs to allow that to happen. And what this is also going to give you is defensibility of there's a compensating control around this. We need to have a temporary exception because of a project. It's going to give you that defensibility of audit that, yes, I saw this. Yes, I thought this through. And yes, this is a deliberate decision that we made. Next slide, please. Again, we're back to NSPM, how we're going to help you do that. You're going to get those reports. You're going to get them on an automated basis. We're going to run through. We're going to help you keep your exchanges from being overly broad. Um, prior to using Firemon, I was Firemon client too. Prior to using Firemon, I was in CAB, Change Control Board, twice a week, two to four hours, four to eight hours a week, sitting there with our spreadsheets. Did we hit all of the rules we need to hit? Did we hit too many? Were we violating PCI? Were we violating some other regulatory standard? Where were our gaps going to be? What Firemon is going to give you is going to give you the ability to go ahead and review all that on an automated basis. We're going to tell you, hey, this rule is going to violate PCI. This one over here, maybe is going to violate something else. This one is fine. And if you do need to make that exception, you're going to have the documentation behind it. Then after you've done that, you've got rule documentation because as part of the business justification, the application owner, the business owner, when you put that in as part of the rule, that's then going to be saved as rule documentation and you can report on that at any point in time. So you can run those audit reports and, and you're not going to spend hours and you're going to have much more defensible evidence in the case of that audit. Next slide, please. What what we're hearing, and, and I saw this myself, is it's a lot less time. The customer who took you know, five and a half months to get their PCI. Now they're down to about three weeks. Talk to another customer just a couple weeks ago. We're looking at five months. We're hoping we can get down, them down to less than a month. Going through that, as you get through that crawl, walk, run, getting all your rule documentation in, getting your rule changes, going through automation and getting all that reporting set up, that's time you're getting back. I had that four to eight hours a week in cab. I took Firemon and, and I could get down to, down to about 30 minutes twice a week. You've got less resources. The time that your people are not spending going through rule reviews, filling out another spreadsheet, chasing down who owns this application now, oh, somebody left, I, I don't know what application this went to, that's time they're going to get back to do something else. And those changes are going to be accurate. You're not going to be sitting in cab, you're not going to be sitting in that audit guessing, did I hit all the devices I need to hit? Have I gone too broadly? Am I hitting PCI scope where I didn't intend to? You know, what have I possibly done incorrectly here? Next slide, please. And that, that, we're going to do it with Policy Manager, which is Firemon's entire suite. We're going to bring in all those rules. Doesn't matter if they're cloud, SD-WAN, on-prem devices, firewalls, routers, switches. We're, we're going to bring them in and we're going to let you look in one place. We're going to be monitoring those devices. We're getting real-time change. We're, if you're interfacing with your vulnerability scanner, your Tenable, your Qualys, your Rapid7, we're going to get vulnerability detection. The reporting and the querying is infinite. Um, I write a fair amount of scripts for people. Hey, you need to do this here. You can do this easily within the program. You can find these things and you can search across your entire ecosystem. You don't have to go to one console to look at your AWS and then another console to look at your Palo Alto and then another console to look at your F5. Because we're API centric, that's where the scripting fund comes in. I've got clients that consume their data in a way that works for them. Maybe they've got a home-built dashboard. Maybe they're using something enterprise class where they bring in the data they need to see. They've got it continuously running. Here's my set of PCI devices. Let me know immediately when something changes there and they can get alert in that dashboard because that API exists there for them to do that. So you can get it as customized as you want it to be. You can get it as generic as you want it to be and you can set up that cadence. I talk, I talk a lot when I'm talking to clients about crawl, walk, run. Get everything in there. Take a look at it. As Dan referenced earlier, define your scope. What is in scope for PCI for you? Get those in a special area. Get those set up. Get those tagged within Firemon. One of my favorite new features in Firemon is the ability to do tags within the platform. We'll bring in like your Palo Alto tags, your Azure tags, the things that the vendor brings. 
But where that shortfall is to me is those are vendor specific. I can't take a Palo Alto tag for PCI and apply it to my Azure space or my AWS space. We've got the ability to tag so you can immediately see, hey, this rule has a tag. It has something to do with PCI. We need to be careful with the changes here. And that is what I have for you. If we can go on to the next Q&A, well, I'd be happy to take any questions. I'm sure Dan would as well. Absolutely. Lisa, Dan, thank you guys so much for such an interesting uh, walkthrough, a conversation. I, I really, really enjoyed uh, listening to both of you. And I know that the audience has as well, because we have a lot of questions <laughs> coming in. Uh, and I do want to get to those. Dan, I know you've been busy on live chat while Lisa was just talking. So we've got a lot of answers flowing, uh, but still some questions left to get to. So Lisa, Dan, are you guys ready? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I like it. All right, well, I am going to start with this question for you, Dan. Um, how much does full tokenization reduce the PCI scope? Does this reduce the networking scoping requirements? Uh, it certainly can. Um, it, the important, very key items to remember from a scoping perspective is uh, whether or not something is considered in scope for PCI compliance all revolves around that primary account number or PAN. Uh, that one piece of data really drives everything else. Um, you know, we could spend a whole other hour talking about scope, but the short version to support this particular question is that, yes, tokenization can help to significantly reduce scope. Um, it typically uh, will not fully eliminate it, but it will put a big dent in it. Uh, being familiar with what constitutes CDE in scope um, versus connected to in scope versus security impacting in scope is absolutely essential as part of um, you know determining that scope accurately. Hmm. Okay, yeah, identifying each of those pieces. Um, okay, Lisa, I'm going to kick this next one to you. How do I determine which firewalls are in scope? The scoping is the theme of our conversation so far uh, for my PCI audit. First, know what you have and where you have it. Mm. That is probably the most important piece of advice I can give you. Well, that's a that's a good solid piece of advice. You need to know right. where and, and I. Yeah, I can wholeheartedly second that. Uh, that's that is it. That's it's 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 one of those things that sounds simple when when yes. we say it and in, and in reality um is really not um and really can't emphasize that enough uh is uh knowing what you have and where you where you have it um you know is 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 absolutely foundational uh as with anything in cybersecurity, you can't protect it and quite frankly you can't comply with a standard if you don't know what you have and where it is absolutely yeah. Yeah. Then from, from, sorry, go ahead, Lisa. Just from a networking perspective, at a very high level within Firemon, we, we can't tell you where that card data is and where that interface is. Where I like to tell people to start is let's start with your topology map. Mm. Let's look at the places you know you have card data. Then let's look at that topology and look what, at what connects to that. And then we'll get your outliers. Then from there, as Dan referenced earlier, let, let's start defining your scope. What is in scope? What, what rules are in scope? what rules are allowing that traffic, and, and let's get those set aside to take a closer look at. Well, I think that's so important. And, and Lisa, I, th I thought it was funny. I was laughing when you said you don't like single pane of glass, because I think a lot of people really <laughs> hate that one. But I like single lens. Um, but, I, but I think that visibility um, is so key. So, so starting with understanding what you have, knowing what you have, and then deciding what is going to be in scope as it is sort of our step step one and step two, if we were just getting rolling. Absolutely. Okay. Um, awesome. You got to know what it is. You got to yep. know what you have. You got to know where it is. And you got to know how it's talking to other things. Uh, great. Yeah. And as Dan just said, that all sounds, when you say that, I'm like, yeah, check, check. That sounds very easy. But obviously, uh, easier said than done and uh, and continues to be an issue, I think, for a lot of us. Um, Dan, I'm going to kick another question back to you. Let's see. Let's, let's go with this one here. Um, what happens if my PCI assessment starts before March 31st, but is not actually completed by then, can I still certify under version 3.2.1? So that's gonna be a question for the acquiring bank uh, in a merchant's okay. case. 
So okay. um, that's a, that's a conversation, and that's another aspect with regard to the whole compliance journey that I, I really can't emphasize enough. Um, having good faith conversations with your acquirer is also absolutely essential. Uh, by and large, um, you know the vast vast majority of acquirers. If you are proactively having those conversations and being real with them as to here's where I'm at with regard to my compliance status. Um, you know, if here's the, what that, you know, in the example of this question, where that timing is landing, um, you know, that's something that the acquirers are going to work with you uh, yeah. in 99% of the cases, um, if that conversation is happening proactively in good faith. Uh, and that also extends to even to very large ones like uh, some little one you may have heard of called American Express, because technically they are acquirers as well with a closed network. Um, have those conversations, have them now, um, and they will help to, to help you to, to map out what their expectations are. Um, and, you know, in this particular example, they'll advise on, on what they would be, be willing to accept. They do have some, uh, a little bit of, of flexibility there for those kinds of situations. Isn't that such an important thing that, that uh, being proactive and asking questions? I mean, it sounds like the, the resources, the help, the support is there. Um, but you need to take steps to make sure you understand and, and ask those questions early on is kind of what I'm taking away from that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Getting out in front of it. That solves a lot of problems in life, Dan, I think from um, <laughs> you know, car maintenance through to cybersecurity <laughs> proactivity. Um, let's go with this next one here. Lisa, I think I'm going to kick this one over to you on the AWS side of integration. Does it integrate with generic security groups and NACL or, or rote tables, or it needs to be a specific AWS firewall? We can absolutely integrate with AWS without needing the firewall. We'll bring in the NSGs, bring in security groups, bring in all the policies there. And then again, you've got the visibility mm. to see what you've got and what you're allowing. Um, I do have clients in the PCI space that are using FireMon with the native AWS without any firewall implementation yet. You can do that singly. If you've got just a few, you can do it from an organizational level. If you've got a ton of subscriptions, we, we can handle it both ways. Awesome. All right, well, um, we are getting close to the end of time here. We still have a ton of questions. So um, before I get to my last question here, Lisa and Dan, I do want to uh, uh, let you know that we are going to make sure all these questions get sent over to your team. So for everyone out there in the audience that is still having questions trickle in, I, I know that we're leaving a lot unanswered here. You will get follow-ups and responses back, so please do keep those coming in. Um, we'll wrap up on this question here. Lisa, how do I prevent people from unintentionally granting access in or out of CD after I have reviewed and cleaned up my in scope roles. Uh, it's back to, and I know I'm kind of a broken record here. What do you have and where do you have it? I like to tag all my rules with PCI. Um, so I know when there's a rule change going through, I, like I said, I transitioned into FireMon, so I had the ability to go through and get a rule review get an automated rule review so it's saying hey i've got a palo alto here i've got these seven rules they're tagged with pci the device itself is flagged as pci here's a, here's a potential unintentional change that's going in we haven't looked at the impact of this i would much rather catch it on the front side use that automation let the intelligence of the controls do it for me and warn me before i put in that poor rule and get an unintentional exposure then go back when i'm getting ready for audit and try and fix a bunch of things after the fact well, I feel like that fits in well with our, our key themes of the day. So we have the, the visibility and, and understanding, knowing where you at, where you're at, setting those scoping parameters, and then also, um, you know, really, uh, uh, I guess, being being aware of uh, the proactivity there, being ahead of things and, and trying to avoid. And I think, you know, again, easier said than done, having to be in a reactive state. Um, so I think those are my key takeaways. Uh, Dan and Lisa, I'd love to ask you guys if there's sort of one final thought and Dan, maybe we'll start with you and then Lisa, you can wrap us up. If there was one sort of final thought or key takeaway or key action step, you know, that you would want to make sure everyone has in mind, what, what would that one thing be? Uh, I'm going to continue, I'm going to continue the theme, uh, referring back to, uh, the, the, our top five things to start now, if I have to pick one item out of there, it's going it, to, it's going to be that scope, uh, yeah. understanding, uh, understand the rules, you know, what, what, what constitutes in scope. There's three different kinds of in scope, understanding that, uh, as a prereq to then correctly, 
um, identifying, uh, defining, and documenting uh, your scope in your environment is, is going to be number one. Hmm. Yep. All right, Lisa, what do you got for us? Well, I have to absolutely second that scope. Um, my key here would probably be, whether you're doing it with Firemont or, or something else, think about where you need your people to be spending their time. Let the technology take the pieces from them that they can do. Let the technology take the pieces of where does the change need to go? Am I crossing any PCI? Am I violating a control? Let the technology do that for you and let the people worry about the parts you can't automate. I haven't talked to a client at all in the last couple of years who's come to me and said, yeah, I have enough people, I have enough money, no problem. Most <laughs> people are resource constrained either in manpower, money, or both. So use that technology so that you're using that human skill, that human capacity to its fullest and, and let the technology pick up the, the stuff that it handles best. Boy, that'd be a nice thing if we all got to wake up every day and go, yeah, yeah, I got, I got everything. I got it all. Yeah, I don't have to worry about any of it, right? That'd be great. <laughs> that uh, makes well, assessors that's... very happy as well. <laughs> that's right. That's the, <laughs> that's, the, that's the goal, Dan. This is where we're headed. Uh, well, Dan and Lisa, thank you so much for being here with us today. This conversation has been so interesting and, and I think, again, timely uh, and informative. And, and it's really been fun to, you know, and who, who would have thought that we would have so much fun digging into <laughs> compliance standards, but it has been a great time. And so I want to thank both of you for being here with us today and, and for some great information. Awesome. Well, thank you so much so for much. having us. <laughs> All right. And to all of you out there who are asking some great questions, keep those questions coming in. Again, we're going to make sure that you get some answers back from the crew so you will hear back. Um, and I, I know that we didn't get to all the questions today. And I love seeing all the engagement from everyone out there. Uh, just absolutely fantastic conversation happening. If you are looking for a little bit more information right away, I'm also going to remind you about the handouts tab. Be sure that you've got that solution brief mapping of PCI 4.0 to essential network security controls. So again, Again, what we've been talking about, compliance is complicated, it's layered, there's a lot to think about. And this is such a helpful and easy walkthrough of how Firemont solutions are going to meet the needs of essential network controls and how those are going to fit into PCI requirements. So go and get that downloaded, hold on to that uh, and, and save that for after we wrap because you are going to want to come back to that later on. I promise you, you'll want that memory jog. I've also seen a few people asking about follow-ups, wanting to make sure that they're going to be able to uh, you know, go back through some of this information because there was a lot uh, packed into an hour today. So I do wanna remind you all that we will make sure that you get the on-demand version of this webinar so you will be able to go back through the information. And if there's anything else that you want to get, just flag it in that questions window. Hey, I'd, I'd love to get a you know more solution briefs. I'd like to have a follow-up conversation, whatever it is. And we're gonna make sure that that information gets on over to the Firemon team. So make sure that you've got those questions coming in. Just flag it to us. Hey, this is what I'd like. This is what the follow-up uh, would be. And then we will make sure that that's the follow-up that you get. So uh, lots of opportunities to learn more starting with that solution brief, then that on-demand video, and then whatever else you need. Again, just post in that questions window. We'll make sure it gets to the right places. All right, I see some of those coming in already. Joni, I've got that, so we'll make sure that that gets over to the team there. All right, now we have a one more little bit of fun before I let you all go on about your days, and that is our $250 Amazon gift card. So let's give that away. I will remind you that you do need to be here live and present at the webinar in order to win. And our lucky winner of a $250 Amazon gift card today is David Durko from New Jersey. David Durko from New Jersey, congratulations to you. As always, we will follow up about claiming your prize after we wrap up today. All right, my friends. Well, with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to once again thank Firemon and GuidePoint Security for making this webinar possible. And especially to all of our incredible or to both of our incredible speakers, to Lisa and to Dan. You've given us so much to think about today. Uh, just a really interesting conversation and, and with some very practical tips. You know, it's fun to talk strategy and it's to, it's fun to think about these, you know, high level standards. And then I think they did a great job of really bringing it down into how we can take action steps. And that's a really important aspect of these conversations. Uh, and of course, you know, a big high five, a big thank you to all of you out there. Uh, Ken, thanks so much. I see, I see your thanks and high five 
uh, on back. And I appreciate that. It's so great to hang out and have conversations with all of you. And I appreciate, especially as we get to the end of the year and I know how crazy things are. And I so appreciate you taking time out of your day to come and hang out with all of us, take this time to do a little bit of learning together. And of course, you know, we have the best conversations when we're all here together, when we're all participating together and, uh, and getting into these conversations. So I really do appreciate every single one of you. And I hope that I will get to see you all at a web webinar again soon. And until that time, I hope you have an absolutely beautiful end to your day. Thanks all.